on the group size, what I thought I was doing has changed somewhat, but it will make perfect sense, I hope, as we go on. So if learning is going on, it has to be active. And the key is what's going on in the brain, and it's not what we observe. So just because a class is quiet, that does not mean that there isn't learning going on in their brain. However, if we look at active learning, generally we're looking at attempting to get to higher learning objectives. We're thinking of it being creative. But basically, the ultimate goal is to help people, help students, get to that higher level of Bloom's taxonomy in relation to thinking, applying, and creating. So, my question is, a lot of people believe that if I can't do psychomotor skills, that I'm not doing active learning. And my students, you know, feel if they don't get to do a skill, that their day has been wasted when we're at clinicals. And I pretty much tell them that I can teach a monkey to do these skills, <laughs> but I can't teach a monkey it's hard to look at that over here. It's hard, <laughs> very, it's I'm hard to teach a monkey to think about how to alter what they're doing based on the differences in the person we're taking care of. And so, um, learning, active learning absolutely can occur without performing active skills. Here's an example. The day this picture was taken, there were about 200 people attempting to get to the top of Mount McKinley. Um, they had great psychomotor skills. If they didn't have learning skills, thinking skills, critical reasoning skills, they would have ended up with many of the other people in the Talkeetna Cemetery. Very active. Here's my hummingbird. Isn't it cute? Very active. Probably not thinking very much. Okay, so research is showing, and you have this in your handout. Um, it's also on the graph up there, thanks to Jim and Graphic Arts. Yes, research is showing that people generally remember about 10% of what they read. So don't get discouraged when you tell them to read the chapter before class just because they don't know much. Doesn't mean they didn't read it. Usually remember about 20% of what they hear. So if you're doing a traditional lecture with words, on the screen and talking, basically we're hoping for 20% that they're going to remember that. Um, and if we look at reading and hearing, we're hoping to get to define, list, describe in relation to Bloom's taxonomy. So an audio lecture, or putting your online lecture with your face, kind of like 20%. <clears throat> generally remember approximately 30% of what they see. And that doesn't mean reading the words on the screen, that means seeing what you're talking about. So an animation perhaps, a diagram or a picture, something like this, um, a concept map maybe. And some students do well with concept maps. I post these on Blackboard, I don't print them all out for students because not everyone learns that way and some of them love them. But um, that's just an example. Now if we get to having students see and hear, we're looking at 50%. We're still in the passive learning triangle, according to research. Um, so a video clip. And you know, embedding video clips into your PowerPoint, if you're using PowerPoint, is great. But if you don't know how to embed them, Barry taught me four years ago, and it was like magic. I thought, yes because I kept opening things and saving them on the bottom and I didn't know what I was doing. 
Um, <clears throat> but a lecture with words isn't seeing. Okay, this isn't 50%. Back to 20% if you're just talking and have words. So if you have a lecture with lots of pictures, models, and examples, again, passive learning. And at this point, they might be able to demonstrate a plan practice. But if we can get them to write and say, now we're looking at 70%. And this crosses a line, according to research, from passive to active. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you some examples of some very easy things, some of you are probably already using them, that you can use in a small classroom or a large classroom, um, that get our students to say things and write things. Um, they remember 90% of what they do. And you know, when we get into class, it's difficult to allow them to do things if you don't have a lab. Uh, but you can get them to do things even in a lecture setting that will help us get to these active learning principles. We'll look at some of those things. So this bottom part of the triangle here, saying and writing or doing is our active learning where we are told by researchers that at this point they're going to begin to be able to analyze and define create and evaluate, which is what we want our students to be able to do. Any questions? You've seen this before? Makes sense? Okay, so this is another note of interest, and I totally changed around what I do now based on this information. 70% of what they hear in the first 10 minutes. 20% of what they hear in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and so what I've done is I started out with the most important concepts um, in the beginning of class. Um, and like a test review or a review of content I've already covered where they're motivated to listen, I put that at the end of class. Um, the complex stuff I put right at the beginning. Okay, so traditional lecture, a lot of people don't want to give it up. It is kind of efficient. And I'll tell you what, if you're uncomfortable, students are uncomfortable with any change. And um, students are very uncomfortable when you start doing unusual things. And they get crabby. And they say, I don't like to role play. I don't like to do this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, um, they need repeated experiences, and so do we. Have you all seen Death by PowerPoint? Humor is great. If you haven't seen it, yes, no, it's like four minutes. It's pretty funny. Pretty good. We'll see if the embedding worked, Harry. Hello. That there's some things I hate about PowerPoint, and I figure it's kind of my duty to point them out. So here we go. Here's common PowerPoint mistakes. Uh, number one, uh, people tend to put every word they are going to say on their PowerPoint slides. Although this eliminates the need to memorize your talk, ultimately this makes your slides crowded, wordy, and boring. You will lose your audience's attention before you even reach the bottom of your uh, first slide. Please don't do that anymore, please. Uh, number two, most common, uh, many people do not run spell cheek. <laughs> Big mistake. Nothing makes you look stupider than spelling errors. If it's got a red line under it, recheck the spelling. And then finally, I hate this, uh, avoid excessive bullet pointing, only bullet key points. Too many bullet points, and your key messages will not stand out. In fact, the term bullet point comes from people firing guns at annoying presenters. <laughs> Hence the bullet point. Uh, bad color schemes, not good. Clashing background and font colors can lead to distraction, confusion, headache, nausea, vomiting, and loss of bladder control. I can't stay on that one too long. Here's something I've noticed. Uh, the number of PowerPoint slides you have in your talk, uh, the less uh, useful your talk actually is. 
Unfortunately, uh, my presentation is right there. I've also noticed this. People love to pack data into their presentation. They shove more and more data thinking it's better, but it's not. The more data you have, the harder it is to read your slide, and the effectiveness plummets. Now, you can, uh, you can improve the effectiveness by adding some shading and some 3D effects and then some second order and third order effects. And then, I know, let's add some labels. That'll help a lot. And that, that's pretty much every marketing slide I've ever seen right there. Then some like VP of marketing stay there and going, it's real clear in Q4. What the hell are you talking about? Now, I'm, I'm into uh, in animation. People become animators in PowerPoint. You can have things flying all over the place, and that can be good. If you're a visual learner, that will improve the effectiveness of your performance. But if you're easily distracted, more animations, and people have no idea what you're talking about. They're just, wow, that is cool, wow. And there's regions here, by the way. There's the uh, simple but uh, effective region. There's the active but confusing, the uh, effective but boring, the active but ineffective, the dull but static region, the uh, busy but useless, the ADD only region, the uh, useful but amusing, the stupid but confusing, the dull triangle, the hyper triangle, the sleepy square, the dizzy pentagon, and everything else I just uh, call pointless motion. <laughs> that slide right there took me an hour and a half to make right there. <laughs> PowerPoint can just suck the life out of you. It's amazing. <laughs> I've also come up with this. It's a kind of a little science I've invented called font analysis. Basically, the font you choose says something about who you are as a person. There's a huge list of fonts, and you choose one, and that says something about you. So be careful the font you choose. <laughs> For example, if you choose Courier New, uh, this happens to be my favorite, uh, you're probably organized in structure. If you choose Matisse, it means you're artistic. And if you choose Times New Roman, it means you're lazy, apathetic, and unimaginative, and you always use the default. <laughs> A lot of Times New Roman people. Welcome. We have some more. Uh, do you use freehand script? Uh, you're a horrible speller, so you try to hide it with a hard-to-read font. Very smart. If you use Gothic, it means you're very pale and you wear black. And if you choose Wingdig, it means you're a nerd and you have no life. In fact, if you know what those symbols mean, you will never have a date, trust me. Don't bother me. Oh, it's over anyway. Anyway, I have to tell you that I was guilty of most of those things. Um, partially because, I mean, I would put everything on my slide because when I first started teaching, I didn't want students in my class to know more than I did. And if they read the book, I thought, oh my God, I have to everything in the book on my slide. And I didn't know it, so I'd have to have it on my slide. And my slides would look like this. And when I got done, and, and I had one and I took it out that I had dancing and bouncing and jumping, you know. I thought that was magic too. I thought that was active learning. Um, however, um, what I found is that I'd get done and it would be like, oh my God, I just bored myself. It was like, how could they sit there when I couldn't stand listening to myself? So um, I'm not here to lecture bash. I use PowerPoint mostly as an outline. I embed my videos into PowerPoint. It keeps me on track, keeps me from bouncing all over the place. It helps me cover the things I know I have to cover, but I bounce from here to other places. Um, again, any changes in innovation, who would have thought this was an innovation for Starbucks in Seattle? Um, in order for <clears throat> any kind of change to work, I, the, the, how seats are arranged isn't important. I don't believe it is. Um, but it has to be risk-free. And you have to be able to admit when you make a mistake as the instructor. Um, and you need, they need to know that no one knows all the answers and that they should question the written word. Some instructors have their students get um, whatever textbook they want. And then they compare the differences because basically, if you look at textbooks, it's pretty much the same stuff. Um, and they compare and see how they differ um, and, and question that. Again, if you're going to use a lecture, I always just focus on the key learning outcomes. Um, require students to come to class prepared, and that's where many of us have trouble. Now, how do you make sure that they do? Um, remember, they only re remember 
what percent of what they read on their own, 10 percent of what they read on their own. So I give pre-chapter tests, but I don't have a whole lot of points riding on it. So they get a quiz, 10 point quiz, prior to every chapter. If they get a 9 or a 10, they get 2 out of 1, the nominator's 1. If they get a 7 or 8 correct, they get a 1 out of 1. And if they get less than 7, they get 0 out of 1. But it's amazing how motivating that is. Students do read ahead. Um, <coughs> worksheets. What did I do with all those words that used to be on my PowerPoints? Well, I went through and I thought, well, they've had this in AMP, and they've had this in midterm, and they've had this here. And so I picked out the things that I thought, my putting it on a slide isn't going to help them learn it at all. So I gave them worksheets. And it was very clear. I don't care if you do it or not. If you do it, it's going to help you. If you choose not to, you might have trouble on your tests because this information will be covered on the tests, but I don't have to read it to you. So that's one way to free your lecture for the most important concepts. Um, another way is just go around the class. So, you know, if I wanted to, Lori, can you give me an example of an endocrine gland? Serena, an exocrine. So if I believe they know the content, I go around the class and I don't give them a choice. And we'll talk about that in a second. You can ask questions in any, many different ways. Like I just did. They can have their clickers, classroom response system. Um, if you don't have a classroom response system, you can put up a question. Never, very important. Don't go more than four to six slides without asking questions. And never go on to another piece of concept before checking comprehension. Ask everyone equally. So what I tell them is say, this goes against every principle of adult education. But I don't care. I am going to ask each of you, because the most important thing you can learn, I think as a person, but I say as a nurse, is I don't know, but I will find out. And so, and they learn to say that, and then they giggle. Um, <clears throat> when I evaluate it, because I evaluate all of the techniques that I use at the end of every class semester, they love it. They hate it at first, but they'll say things like, it kept me awake, made me pay attention, it kept the big mouth up in front from answering all the questions. Um, it, you know, so they do like it. <clears throat> And this was an example, if you have a class or response system, you can have them use their clicker. If you don't, you can give them colored paper. Or you can just have them raise their hand. But if they have colored paper, green for one, red for blue, just have them hold it up in there. Yeah, or they could go like this. Yeah, but you can get the same kind of thing. Okay, so key concept review. Say and write. What percent do they remember if they say and write? 70%. So how do we do this in a lecture setting, not a lab setting? One of the things um, we'll do right now, if you have a piece of paper, I'd like you to individually write what you know about a negative feedback system. Um, let's use the, oh, okay, whatever one you want, or should I give you one specific? Thyroid gland? Negative oh. feedback, no? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that is not where my, I thought negative feedback, I was thinking like feedback to oh, the students. Oh, slapping you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want dog mothers. <laughs> Got That's it. That's my goal. Okay. So, write what you know about the, how the negative feedback system works in the endocrine system. Because remember, if indeed this has been covered somewhere else, this is a huge concept that they have to know for nursing. I need to know do they know it? So I can use this either prior or I can use this after I covered it. First of all, you sit at your desk and you write what you know. And sometimes everyone looks at me like, okay? And sometimes people are writing like crazy. After the appropriate amount of time then, Generally, they have a number for the week, and I use playing cards. I have that in the beginning of your handout. So for any group activity, I didn't do that with you guys, but they get their cards. And so I'll say, okay, all the twos go together and share your information. And see if you can teach each other something. See if you can clear some things up for each other. Um, 
That's one, that's think pair share. That's all it is. Cover a concept, test their retention, their understanding by having them write it and then share it. And then we discuss it. So how did you do? So tell me what's going to happen to the TSH level if your patient has a problem with their thyroid where it's hypothyroid. Tell me what's going to happen to the TSH level. And I also have, I didn't bring it, but I have this outline of a body. And um, I should have brought that, sorry. The um, post-its were great. So I'll give every student maybe three or four post-its, and one will say temp increases, and one will say TSH goes up, and one will say thyroid hormone goes down, and they'll have hypothyroid, hyperthyroid. And with their slips, they have to match it to and put it where it is. So the thyroid has a thyroid hormone, the hypothalamus has a releasing hormone, the anterior pituitary has the TSH, and they have to figure out, is it high or low based on what's going on? So that's another way to test their comprehension. But anyway, <clears throat> you can, and you can use blank body things. I'm going to have some laminated so that I can just write whatever I want on it instead of having to change it when I do GI and endocrine. And then they just take their post-its, very cheap, and see how they do. That's the pair share. You can use it any number of ways. You could, if you didn't want to uh, waste time moving, although it's good for them to get up, um, they could just share with the person they're next to. Or if you want them to get into different groups, which I like to do, you give them the card on the way in and they sit by those groups. They get to know the class, they get to know how the others are thinking. <clears throat> Jigsaw, very similar. I gave you a sample in your handout. So I want them to think, and I want, I want them to write, and I want them to say. I want them to present, because we're getting to that 70 to 90%. Well, again, if I had 16 students, this is an example, and you can do it in any way you want. I decide what content I want them to cover in which lab. So let's just look on January 29th. They were going to have to present infection control. Well, you know how group projects work. I live in Okanagan, I live here, blah, blah, blah. They're not doing anything. So what I do is, I have this without their names on the left. I hand out their cards. I say, okay, all the twos on January 29th are going to present standard precautions. I want you to, and I give them an outline, a guideline of what they have to have on it, because this is material that has to be covered. So, they go home and individually they prepare this. They come back and I give them like five or ten minutes at the beginning of the class. Go over, make sure you have everything that you know everyone else has. Share what you don't have, and then they break up into their into their suit. So the twos are doing standard, the threes are doing droplet, the fours are doing airborne, the fives are doing contact. They do that on their own. They write it. They come. They share with their group to make sure everyone is consistent. And then they break up into their suit and they teach that small group of students. And it it's just works so well because the students who don't present in a big group, they're still, they're comfortable in this small group. And, they're, and so like with standard precautions, I actually set up the rooms. I said, okay, you need to go take a blood sugar on this patient using this precaution. And you know, I know I'm using nursing, but it works throughout any concept. So um, <coughs> you just, based on the, because I, I do some group presentation and stuff, but two, I, you give out the twos, and like you said, you, all it says on there is your two, so you need to take care of this. This so is they, blank until I give them the cards, and then and I then tell so them they what they have, and I fill out their names, and then afterwards I type it. So I do so it for Do they home. know who's doing what, like the other students? They can, yeah, sure, I'll tell them. That's oh, fine. Okay. That's okay. fine. Because one of the, I, I thought, that um, my thought there was, oh, if they don't know what other students are doing the same thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. that's the, if they don't know who's relying on what, then they, they are the one being relied on. But because then you subdivide, they still, they don't. If they they know, have to. They're, they're the to ones that it. have to teach it. Yeah. And they can use each other's knowledge to okay. get it complete. And if you give them a guideline of what absolutely has to be on there, you know, like for this one, okay, what protective equipment do you have to wear? How do you wash your hair? You know. Anyway, so that's a jigsaw assignment. Again, cooperative testing. Um, a lot of people will say, "Oh, cooperative testing—that's awful." But the way we do cooperative testing is 
Everyone takes a test on their own. And basically their grade is their own test. And any essay they take on their own. And then they turn that in. They come back and again they get divided up into their card groups. Usually I put them in groups of three or four. They take the multiple choice section and only the multiple choice section and redo a Scantron with however many names are in the group. If they, as a group, can come up with a 90 or above, they get two extra credit points, which they don't get many extra credit in the nursing program, so they're excited. They get one if they get an 80 to an 89. They get nothing if it's less than 80. If they fail the test on their own, they don't qualify for the extra points. Um, and then, in that group, what you find is the students who are pretty smart, but not very verbal, start talking. And I'll tell them, I don't want to hear you say, I remember she said that. I want to hear you say, this is what I think and this is why. And so they give each other rationales, they learn from each other, they learn different rationales. And they love it. They come in, like I usually will have to schedule tests at least three times a semester on different days than class days, and they're willing to do that, to come in and do it. So they love that so much, they ask for it. Yeah, they please, really please, enjoy can it. we do collaborative testing? Because they get instant feedback on their test. <laughs> because then I go over the right answers with them after all of them do it. They know how they did it, and I know why they got it wrong when it means something to them, when they're really motivated, and um, anyway, I, I, it works well. So it takes a lot of time. That's the disadvantage. So the people that fail the tests, what do they do during this time? They, they participate. They just don't qualify for the points. points. Because if they fail the test, then they probably aren't going to contribute. Contributing. And the reason we did that is we didn't want, even though, well, I don't know. It's a good motivator to pass the test. It is. Do well on your own. And they still learn because they're participating. Um, unfolding case studies. You could do this in any course. Unfolding case study. Where they need, like I use this as a test review sometimes, or I'll use this as a concept review. So we've already covered hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, whatever it is. What I prefer to do is I like to use this after we've covered about six things and see if they can figure out where we're at. So I'll give them. For instance, um, did I give an example? There. Here's your patient. What do you think could be wrong? And I, didn't, I took out all these slides, but the way it goes is, read this. Tell me what you think could be wrong. How, what questions are you going to ask to find out if you're right or not? What labs do you have to look at? Um, what other symptoms do we have to find out about? And so we go on, and we get them to the right place, and then we talk about, well, what would the lab show? What would the uh, medicines would you expect them to be on? What food should they be eating? But again, you can take this from any topic, I think, and bring them there. Simulation on the fly. I put on a wig or whatever. Again, with a group of nurses, it works better because then you know the questions that you have to ask. But for instance, they love it. I might put on a gown and a wig and put a balloon in my belly, gray hair, and I'll say, they'll come in and they have to figure out what's wrong with me. And so if I act really confused and if I say, I have to get back, I have to get back, and anyway, I, this one is with the balloon in my belly is ascites with liver failure and cirrhosis, and I act confused and I keep, and they say, oh, the cops brought you in, which means I was homeless on the street and I'm anxious to get back to my bath. Anyway, we have fun with that. <coughs> It works pretty well. Um, and everyone's involved because the students at the desk have to dar, have to document what they think is going on. And they come up and try to figure out what's going on. Um, any concept that you're teaching, <coughs> it's with drugs, but any concept that you're teaching, um, if you take your group of however many you have, put the name in the middle, and then have like, give me an example of what you want them to know in chemistry about a specific element. Atomic number. Okay, so you'd have that here, atomic number, uses in industry. I mean, do you get into any of that? Or, okay. Anyway, so concepts that are important to whatever that concept is. And then you just, it's like a 
you pass them around in your small group and everyone can write whatever they think is right. In other words, for Lasix, a drug, um, we would put things like outcome, lab values, patient education, and so for Lasix, we need to know what the potassium is and for lab values, and, and they just throw it around. Every two minutes we switch and they get all excited. And so you, you move the piece of paper between groups? Is that what you mean? Each group does the same drugs. So if I'm going to concentrate on cardiac output, I would use the cardiac output drugs. There'd be Lasix, there'd be DIG, there'd be whichever one I wanted to choose. And then each of them would have to pass it and try to fail out oh, anything they could. One group. So different people one are group. different ones different in a group. group. Got it. Okay. And it just gets them going. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mama's done. Props are wonderful. If you're going to talk about vision problems. And look in your catalogs um, because when we talk about endinoxia, for instance, or retinopathy or detached retina, these glasses give them an idea of what the vision is like if they have that problem. And very cheap, very simple. If you want to look at them, but... I don't really know what I have. <laughs> <laughs> you already know it? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't. Okay. Um, things like... Here we go. This will work for... Oops. This works for DI and SIADH, but it also would work for... Tonicity, hypertonic and isotonic. So there's a condition of the um, posterior pituitary, ADH is a hormone that holds water. And so this is happy brain cells because percentage of stuff and percentage of water is perfect. My brain cells are the size they should be. If we're talking about tonicity, we kind of do the same thing. Except it's a little different. Um, <laughs> with SIADH, you have too much ADH, so you're holding water, but you're not holding anything else. So I have the same exact amount of sodium in here, but all I've held on to is water. And because of that, which way does the water go? Water goes where the stuff is. The brain cells swell. So I get these big, fat brain cells. With DI, not enough ADH, I'm losing all my water. I still have all my salt. The water from the brain cells go into the blood, and my brain cells shrink. Makes no difference. Seizures come to death. The brain doesn't care if it's swollen or shrunk. That's what our results are going to be. You can use that with tonicity a little bit different. Um, numbers. How do we look at numbers? Oh, if you're trying to. Here, Barry. <laughs> no? We talk about just losing five pounds of fat. That's five pounds of fat. So showing something like that, if you can get props, is so effective. And we talk about how much fat we should eat. We should eat no more than two tubes of saturated fat, okay? I know, gosh. No more than that. Well, if I went to McDonald's and had a McGrilled, McGrilled, look at this, McGrilled chicken sandwich. Not too bad. If I add a small order of fries, if I have a quarter pounder with cheese, but again, you can say grams, you can say those words, but when you show them a visual, and that's just, there's all kinds of other options up here, but. Um, numbers. What does it mean, what do you think about how many people die from homicides in this country? What would you guess, how many die a year? All of them. 4,000. A year? Okay, students out, I mean, if you look at the news, you think everyone's getting killed from homicide. And I'm not a gun advocate, I'm just saying that if you look at the news, that's what we're talking about. So I use BBs. Approximately 16,000 people die from homicide every year. And because BBs are expensive, and I'm not going to get 16,000 of them, about 1,300. 
every beep, every, every click is a death. So approximately 1,300 dynamo. And you get to How many people do you think die of the flu in this country every year? You say that you'll see the numbers. Oh, and how much do we spend in the criminal justice system for those sixteen thousand deaths a year? Oh, $16 million. Two hundred billion. Wow. Wow. Two hundred billion, sixteen deaths. The flu. Depending on what you read, thirty-five to sixty thousand. So I picked fifty. vaccines in this country? Two or three million. We spend approximately $720 million on vaccines. Now, cardiovascular disease. How many people die from that? 400,000. 600,000 a year, about 50,000 a month. I would have to take all of these and dump them. How much do we spend on, and how much of those, how many of those deaths are prevented by health promotion activities? 80%. How much do we spend on health promotion in this country? Remember, 200 billion on 16 deaths for criminal justice. 300 million in health promotion. Are we what? Yeah, but it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I it's, it's the criminal justice cost. You know, it's like because we can't execute them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we can't you kill our heart attack patients either. Yeah. We keep getting yeah. There we go. Yeah. 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 McDonald's we could, the if we could day, just ex you know, if they got found guilty and executed them, them the next day, the cost would go down, you know, eighty percent at least. I'm not going there. <laughs> If we just cut off their hand when they stole something. But anyway, there's all kinds of things. You know, balloons are perfect cardiac output. You know, when you talk about preload, afterload, contractility, balloons are wonderful. You can demonstrate all of that. You can de demonstrate modeling after a heart attack. Um, but I use balloons for um, shapes of around atoms and stuff, the tetrahedral and here, like why they are. Balloons are, I mean, if I had to have one thing, I'd keep my balloons. But I'm, I'm not, I have other humor things or whatever, but I don't need to, to go. But what, what are you guys, what are you guys doing in terms of getting students saying and writing or? Well, I do different things in my class, in my classes, but like the ones that I lecture in, um, like the, it, I, I introduced the concept check thing several years ago, and like you said, after every six to seven slides, or at least after each one, you put that in, and it's huge. And I never spent the time on the clicker thing. <laughs> so this always use the, the finger, but it gets them engaged. If people, uh, you know, I have a, I have a rule of half the class is an answering, I stare at them. <laughs> and then they have more to do for homework. So, mm -hmm. you know, usually, and then if so, if you know most people got it right, you can move on. and. Sometimes, depending on the concept and what it is, if it's kind of a half and half, I ask them to look around and see who has a different answer than them and make them talk. Yes. And if like people definitely just haven't gotten it, then I just kind of start back and like, okay, here's the thought process and stuff. So that sort of thing works really well. Um, a big part of that know. too is um, uh, risk-free environment. Because I can say, okay, who doesn't get it? And go to someone who doesn't have a hand up, and you guys need to teach them because you can probably teach them different. You're, you're using, you know, different <coughs> methods, and they might get it from you. And now raise their hand. I don't get it. And the other thing that you talked about, I do kind of I incorporate it more in some of my classes would be good. But like um, the having them do a little on their own, and then you know talking with one or two other people, and then sharing it as a class is really huge because. 
If you ask a question, they just stare at you. If you ask them to write it down or talk to your neighbor about it, then you actually get answers to the question. And it's, and you, I mean, you can have them talk to their neighbor for a minute, and that's it. Exactly. And, get answers. and they don't know when I say, take out a piece of paper, if I'm going to collect it with their name on it, or if I'm going to let them go on. And so they take it seriously. They don't just kind of sit there with their. But it's it, rounding. I, I made that note, the concept map, but I called it rounding. Okay. I talked about that. I, really, I like that a lot. And the use of the cards to, for, because at the end of the semester, there's a, um, I usually have some topics then that kind of bring mm -hmm. things together that I have them do. And that seems like a, a, an effective way so you don't have one person doing all the work and yeah. all of that stuff. And I, I think I might try that this semester, actually. I like, I like that a lot. So when I have cards in my hand, I'm not playing cards in my classroom. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing you can do with cards is if you have two decks, you can, instead of saying, okay, you, and you, and you, and you, because that's easiest, you can just take your deck and say, okay, two hearts. It's a little more dramatic. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and sometimes it keeps them more on their toes because they're not sure who's going to be next. Because when I'm going like this, you can just see them scurrying through their notes yeah. trying to because they know what topic I'm on. But um, lots of things. I have a, a well, I do a Cushing's demonstration. Do you all know what Cushing's is? I won't, okay, that won't matter. I'll show whoever <laughs> wants to see later. <laughs> but there's so many things that you can do just to break things up. And if you go on YouTube and look for humor, like I'll just. I have one like the colorectal surgeon song. Um, I could show that if you want. I have it on here. It's hysterical. Um, Shai, that's all in. Do you guys need to leave? I use a um, strainer for glomerular filtration.
and it's like. <laughs> but yeah, here's YouTube. That's something I use a lot today. Yeah. It's very helpful for me. There's, 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 there's a lot of. And the there's educational there's YouTube. YouTube. Well, I just see great. Because like what you said, you can get lost. I just. Yeah. I do. I get lost. I haven't gone there yet. But it's so easy to embed it now that he showed me how to do that. It's, that it's helpful for me because, like, especially if I'm trying to teach like the statistics how to do things with Excel, and you know, there's a video yeah. and it shows exactly how to do it. And it's so nice because then they can just watch it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My babies.